His name is Little Jeff. And I remember countless things about him, but one thing in particular I remember, I remember him having a little chirp in, in the hospital when he would breathe. And I remember he had, he had hair, a lot, a lot of hair, and he, he looked a lot like his older sister. I remember that on his, the day of his funeral, it was extremely windy. Not only from the wind do I remember that, but from the wind blowing my hair and my beard everywhere. Welcome to Still a Part of Us, a podcast where mom and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Lee Red, and on this episode, Jeff is telling the story of his son, Jeff Jr., who was diagnosed with bilateral renal agenesis and passed away shortly after birth. As a word of caution to our listeners, this story contains emotional triggers of stillbirth and infant loss. Please keep yourself emotionally and mentally healthy and seek help if needed. Also, be aware that these birth stories may differ from his or her partners as their accounts are told from their own perspective through the lens of trauma, heartache, and the passage of time. Please respect our mothers and dads who are brave and gracious to share their children with us. So our family consists of me, Jeff, and my wife, Bree, and our daughter, Murphy, and little Jeff, and I'm your, you know, typical nine to five working individual that enjoys coming home from, from a long day's work and, and spending time with, with my family and working on the yard and various projects. What are some of your hobbies? I love to play soccer and watch pretty much most sports except for baseball. It's not slamming baseball. <laughs> um, I, I love to sell things on eBay. It's a, it's a fun, it's a fun hobby to just, you know, doesn't, doesn't make much money, just something to, to, you know, pass the time by with shipping and and managing inventory and whatnot. Is there anything in particular you sell, or? So in particular, I, I sell um, random stuff that's from recovered freight auctions, and it could be anything from rubber bands to electronics of some sort, or used stuff that's been being shipped somewhere. So Bree also sells on eBay separately doing... Um, reselling used clothing and used electronics, anything she finds at, at thrift stores or um, clearance shelves from grocery stores. That's her, that's her full-time gig. We, we, enjoy, we enjoy tackling big, big projects like remodeling our home. In fact, when we found out about little Jeff, we were in the middle of remodeling our, our 1950s home. And if anybody knows the 1950s home, it's it's a large, large task. And I remember, I remember one day tiling the kitchen with with my with my dad and my brother, and and I remember that I just from from everything that we had going on, from learning out early early on in in Bree's pregnancy that we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to keep little Jeff. I just broke down and, you know, you're the people around you don't know how to act. You're, you're, you're even, even your dad and your, your brother, they, I mean, if I'm in that situation and it's somebody else, it's kind of like, well, what do you do? So you can't, you can't blame anybody. Um, except for, 
you know, my dad just gave me a big hug. My brother just gave me a big hug and no one, no one said, no one, no one said in that moment, everything's going to be all right. Because I mean, the story behind little Jeff is that at 20 weeks, we went in for our, our big ultrasound to go over, you know, the key parts and make sure everything was functioning correctly. And we've been through this before with, with Murphy and, and we had no, no complications and didn't have a, you know, a thought that we would go into this, you know, learning of a complication. And we were, you know, sitting in that room, you know, a dark ultrasound room and had, you know, the, the doctor doing the ultrasound from the get go. She was very, very quiet and very, um, careful on how she was saying things. And I, I didn't necessarily pick up on that, but Bree did. And as soon as she said, I'm just going to go ask the doctor or your, your main doctor, a few questions, and then we'll be back in a minute. And when she, when she came back in the room, she said, so it looks like you, you have little to no amniotic fluid, which could mean you're leaking amniotic fluid or the baby's not producing any. And that could mean that the, the baby isn't producing urine that in turn doesn't create the, which means that the, the, either the, the urinary tract wasn't, wasn't working or the kidneys weren't functioning. And so when they were looking at the renal artery, they weren't seeing any blood flow to any kidneys, which indicates that there, you know, are n- no functioning kidneys or no kidneys. Either way, the result is the same. And they checked for if there was a leak and that w- that came back negative. And so it, it came out to be that our, our baby has bilateral renal agenesis, which means did not develop working or did not develop kidneys at all. And again, that was about 20, 20 to 21 weeks into, into our, our second pregnancy. And when we, we, we went up to the, to the hospital from, to, to get another look and to go to a, you know, a, a hospital that was more knowledgeable in, um, specializes in, in, you know, prob- problems in pregnancy, um, and, they went through the whole the whole ultrasound all over again like it was fresh and it was all in the same day as the first one and we were i mean un- unfortunately we were thinking the worst uh, as far as like our child isn't isn't going to survive and if there's anything that we we can do, we can do and the result obviously of the of the ultrasound was the same saying no amniotic fluid there's no kidneys, which then in turn does not develop. The baby will not develop lungs because there's no amniotic fluid and then will not survive at birth because not being able, not because it doesn't have kidneys, but because it won't be able to sustain life with the lack of lungs, the development of, of, of his lungs. And even at this time, we were unable to know, they were unable to confirm to us that it was a boy, even though we had gone to a clinic early to find out, and they had told us it was a boy, but since they weren't a- unable to see detailed parts of of little Jeff, because the amniotic fluid is what gives definition to the parts of the baby that they look for, and they came in and presented us two options that we could terminate or carry until or induce whenever, but whether we induced that day or that week or at 35 weeks, the result would be the same that the baby would pass because of, because of its fatal diagnosis and the bi- bilateral renal agenesis. During this whole time, I, I, I mean, both of me and Bree were both in like complete shock and, you know, just feeling like our, our world is just crumbling down around us. Like everything that we felt like we were like remodeling this home, we were, you know, trying 
different things to keep ourselves uh, self busy before we even found out about this. And so everything just seemed like it was laid out all on top of us all at once. Everything in, in her pregnancy was up until this point was, was fine. And it had been fine in the sense of it was like m- when we were pregnant with Murphy, we didn't have, we didn't have any complications. We didn't have any really no worries except for like what it feels like when you're, you know, it's when it's your first child, you've never been through a pregnancy before and you don't really, you don't really know what to expect as, as a parent. But when the second time around feeling like, you know, we've been, been through a pregnancy before. So you're a little more aware of what's going on, but then it almost feels like something out of left field kind of turns you around and upside down. And I mean, we didn't, didn't have any, any fertility issues or anything like that. This has, I don't have any knowledge of this condition being anything that's ever, ever happened in, in my family or in, or in Bree's family. And even if we would have done, we, we didn't really know what we were going to do, whether we were going to induce in two weeks to then start a grieving process because we obviously knew the grieving wouldn't start until when, until we we had little Jeff and until he passed, until we, you know, went through that process, whatever that looked like. At that time I couldn't even tell you couldn't even tell you what it was gonna look like or how it was gonna be or I just couldn't even that's not something I could even imagine. But so yeah, at that time we didn't we didn't know what we were going to do. And after, you know, much, you know, I would say prayer, meditation, thought, we, we, at some point we, we, at some point we decided to carry as long as it was safe for Bree so that we could have as much time with little Jeff as, as possible, knowing the inevitable. And what that looked like was 35, 36 weeks of pregnancy, then, then inducing. During that time, um, after receiving the news of the kidneys and, and, and what the future would look like for little Jeff and you guys, were you just delaying the grieving, knowing you would grieve as well? Or was there a, a time of uh, personally, I would think that if for myself, there would be two different grieving periods, knowing that my son, the writing's on the wall that he won't live, and then after his birth, knowing he won't live. How how was that grieving, or did you just cherish the time of the pregnancy? So that, I think, in and of itself was the, the hard thing, um, being able to, you know, keep the keep the positivity that he was alive and he continued to be alive. And when he was born, he was, he, he was alive, right? It, it was, it was different in the sense that we had, we had him with us and we could feel his kicks. We could, we, she could feel him moving around and, you know, getting into, you know, after the inevitable, after he passed away, which I'll talk about in a second. It, it it was it was definitely a different grief. It was a it was a you know you were you know you had this person and then this person is is gone, and then that part of the grief that wasn't there because he was still alive. Now that he was gone and he passed away, that's when that's when the grief of the loss started, and. Before it was the grief of, I wouldn't say the word, I wouldn't say the phrase preparing ourselves grief, but for the lack of a better phrase, you know, it was the grief that was preparing us for then the inevitable passing away and the, the, the death grief, which in a nutshell, that's, it was very, is very separate. 
very distinct of a grief. He, he lived after birth, he lived for six hours. Um, we held him, we held him every, every single minute. And in the, in the delivery room, she was, she was induced and it was, it was just Bree and I, and, and it was, it was going to be me and Bree in, in the delivery room. And we were going to have her mom for the pictures because of, we didn't want just anybody in there to take pictures and we wanted to spend the time, whatever time we had, instead of like me taking pictures and not being able to be right at Bree's side and by little Jeff's side. And we would have her take the pictures. And a group came up to talk to us from a children's hospital to talk with us about what 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 help is out there for grieving parents, for grieving families, for grieving children. And that, you know, they were explaining a bunch of different things. And it had only been a couple hours since we had come in and, and Bree started feeling feeling some pain and and the, the the group left and Bree just said like, Hey, I'm feeling some pain and the nurse checked and little Jeff was pretty much almost here and it was all happening so fast that we didn't even get to tell our family, you know, before like we as soon as they said that, they said, Don't push or you'll come right out and we get the doctor that's on call. So our doctor that we that we had wasn't wasn't able to get there in time. And her mom for the pictures also wasn't there in time because everything happened so quickly. But we did get, you know, a message out to the family to, to come and that we wanted to be, you know, have everybody come meet him, but then have a quick exit to then let us have our time with me, Bree, Murphy, and little Jeff to then, you know, spend that time as a family to be able to be able to cherish that time that with you know what little time that we had with little Jeff one of the one of the nurses is actually our next door neighbor in the town our town home before and she she wasn't on our service but she came in and she took she took pictures for us and we were super grateful to have like a familiar face in the situation and when when little Jeff when little Jeff came out, they all gave us, you know, they all gave us our space and they, you know, after, after cleaning him up and, you know, he, he, he was alive and he, you know, you could tell, you could, you could hear his chirp like I talked about at the beginning. And at first it was like a very, you know, a very uneasy sound to hear, but it almost, you know, it, it's just something that I hear when I when I think of when I think of my little Jeff, when as he 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 struggled and fought to to spend the time that he did with us, and we um we had him in a blanket on on Umbry's, Umbry's chest and just just held him for. What, what was, of course, not not enough time. So for for us, it was a lot of things that we a lot of things that we did leading up to, and while he was alive, and then even after. A lot of the things we did were to be able to help us with our with our grieving process and and one one thing that we we wanted to do was was um have our family meet meet our you know our little jeff and we watched as like our family members you know, stumbled through the door and and the, the I, I was excited I was excited for 
for my family and for Bree's family to to meet little Jeff and I was you know I was happy for I was, I was grateful for them that they that they did cuz I mean either way they were coming no matter what the circumstance was and either way they were going to meet him and for us it was something special to have you know our family our family support just come marching marching down you know the hallway and into the door and into the room and after after they all after they all left and we were left with you know as a family me Bree Murphy and little Jeff and we had we had Bree's parents take take Murphy out after about 20 to 30 minutes and they transferred us rooms and we had the the rest of the time to to spend with little Jeff and we decided that that we would spend the time with him and then after he after he after he would pass we would then invite anybody to come back to spend time with us and to also spend time with with little Jeff but we wanted to make the most for our grieving process to you know spend that time with him talking with him um and just just holding him and i mean we were trying our best to not think of the inevitable and just cherish those those whatever hours whatever it looked like as as the time went on his his breathing and his heart rate then started to slow to 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 become slower and to almost become unnoticeable and we would every time we felt like you know he had he had passed we would we'd ask the nurse to come in to check his vitals and she would listen for a heartbeat and and listen for breathing and i don't i don't know how many times we had the nurse come in but it was a, it was more than a few times and and you'll never I'll never forget the last time we got the nurse in because that's when obviously she said she was going to go get the the doctor cuz the standard process is they have to you know have the doctor pronounce the infant deceased but obviously in that moment so at that point at that point when she went to go to the doctor there had been it had been six hours since he since he was born and and sure enough doctor comes in and and checks vitals and you know, gives us his condolences and and then walks out of the room and and then you're you know, you feel you have you have we had each other, Bree and I, but we just felt we just felt so overwhelmed with with sadness just you know that even though we knew we were going to lose our child but you know something that you can't really explain you know, losing a child. So the process on from from that from that point was after you know a, a few hours they would bring in a, 
cold cold blanket you know that you can that you would lay the baby on to help from the natural the natural way of you know a, the decay of the body the, de- the inevitable decay of the body it's so gruesome <laughs> but it's it is, what it, is. it is what it is and and we we held him still and we laid by him still and we talked with him still And we and we we still love him as if he was still you know living and laying right next to us. So during the the hospital stay, did you have twenty four hours with little Jeff? Did the did the medical staff say after his demise you'd have twenty four hours with him? Um. So they did say after. After his after his passing, we we did have twenty four hours that we could have him in our room, and at some point, I can't remember what time, but they they offered to take him for to do to do feet prints and to do hand prints and to do like a do a picture so that we, we would have like a keepsake in like an outfit that we had purchased or that they wanted to supply or whatever. And I I think he was gone for maybe an hour or two. And we had already planned to do hands and the feet ourselves just because we wanted to, you know, do that for our keepsake and we knew that they were they would do that for us but we still wanted to do it ourselves just because we had that pride of you know I'm I'm going to do this myself and it's going to it's going to look it's going to look good I'm going to you know put it in his keepsake and I'm going to cherish it forever and unfortunately we had waited too long for the hands and it was extremely difficult to try and do the handprints um, and then, but the feet were, were fairly, fairly easy to do the footprint and, and to have our, have our copy that we did. And, and also we have the copy from the, the hospital that they, they did as well. And we had decided we were going to set a time and then we were going to give him to the hospital to move to the mortuary that we had chosen and start that process. We decided to give him at some point instead of have them take him away from us at 24 hours. And that's some advice we got before beforehand and it, and it actually helped out a lot. So going, I mean, we had we had decided that at eleven twenty one, which is the time he was born, but on the next day, that's the point that we wanted to, you know, start the process of, um, a discharge, you know, getting out of the hospital, b, handing little Jeff over so that we could, then, have him start the process of moving to the mortuary and having them pick, pick him up. Obviously, moving on to the inevitable next parts, which was, you know, a, a funeral, because that's what we we decided that again another thing that we decided to do is as part of our grieving process, and felt like we would benefit from having a little spot to go to, and. When we got out of the, when we got out of the hospital it was a Thursday Thursday afternoon and you know Friday was is the day that happens after Thursday 
and that's when we felt like we would probably want to muster up the courage to try and like go to the mortuary and start the planning and figuring out when when we can move forward and pull off a funeral and we're trying to do it on on that Saturday and the cemetery was having issues on trying to get that timeline to work but it ended up all working out where we were able to get the baby plot which is which is a part of cemetery part of the cemetery that you know set aside for babies and infants for those that choose to put in that area or maybe don't have other plots in that cemetery and that can move move the the baby later in life to a different plot but it worked out with the cemetery in the end and with the mortuary and prior to this Bree neither Bree or I nor I had gone to the mortuary to discuss anything or the cemetery to discuss anything with anybody and so as we stumbled through all this we had a lot of help from our family members and to be able to you know talk with the mortuary and talk with the cemetery and get things get things rolling and I remember Bree and I went to the mortuary to discuss you know a casket and also other th- other things that you know come with funerals that I didn't feel like or think I would ever have to deal with at this time in my life um and as hard as as hard as that <clears throat> as that scenario was um to sit and look at flower arrangements that are supposed to go on the top of an individual's casket that's your size or my size I'm I'm supposed to picture that as a as going on this small little small little box that my my child is is going to be you know put in and Um, so that wasn't the most pleasant none of none of this has been pleasant obviously but none of this has felt natural in in any way as we went to go as we we left the the mortuary we went to go to the cemetery where Bree's parents had been and they had, we had picked a lot over FaceTime. Um, one of their last three lots for the row, which they kind of labeled as 2018, but it was 2019. And, you know, he would be the first 2019 baby to be to be buried in this part of the cemetery we came came around the corner to come check out where where we had selected to see it in person and and driving up to the area and we saw you know city employee digging digging the already digging out the his his little baby plot and I think, I mean, that's when, you know, I think my, I don't know if it was like the reality of the grief that started to like set in or, but that's when like, I remember just breaking down, just breaking down and like I've done so many times before during this during this experience and yeah that's it's 
it's a hard thing to it's a hard thing to look at and to see it's not it's not something you see every day that you you know you go to the cemetery and you see somebody's like grave getting hand dug and it's not just anybody it's your it's your sons so the next day we had the funeral um we got to see little jeff again and he took various items to send with him if you will um letters letters we wrote to him prior to his birth and letters to him from from after from after his birth and I made him a made him a bracelet out of hemp made matching ones for Bree and Murphy and I and made another one for him that we could keep with us but put one on his put one on his wrist and had just just our family immediate family and grandparents come to the the funeral home for a, a small 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 viewing and after a very 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 small service and and prayer we shut the shut the casket and got into the got into a limo, limo and I held held little Jeff in the box as they drove us it is such a small box <laughs> yeah, it's a small box it is such a small box just held, it, just held him just held him on my lap in the small box with with Bree and Mur- and Murphy in the in the limo and we got to the cemetery and got to the curbside and I I just I just could I just couldn't get out. I just couldn't get out of the limo. <laughs> I obviously knew that that was, you know, that was the next step. And if you go, if you if you get out of the limo, that is the next step. And the next step leads to the next step. And I didn't want to take the next step. Finally, mustered up my the courage to to get out of the limo and to bring out the box and to to place him you know on the the graveside and um had some beautiful words that were that were spoken by by Bree's dad and and the and the bishop and then and I, I had the opportunity to say say some words and to, you know, talk about my feelings as, you know, of having having lost having lost a child and it being. I mean, it being the most difficult thing that I've ever had to go through in my entire life, and. Um. And then. And then it all seemed, you know, the all the the funeral. You know, I I said I said my words, and I, we we ended the funeral, and we let some let some balloons go for for little Jeff, some blue balloons, because Murphy said his favorite color is blue. And it was a it was a windy day. And it and it it blew a bunch of balloons right into a tree, and they they popped, but some of them made it through the tree, and 
it was a it was a it was an awesome I mean it was an awesome reminder of you know for us to be able to remember that day you know the blue balloons the the wind and you know all the people that supported us and you know that came and was supporting us and and you know what we were going through so um that's 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 what i remember about the funeral many thanks to jeff for coming on the podcast and telling us the story of his son jeff jr head over to our website still a part of us.com there you will be able to find the show notes including the full transcription of the interview and any resources that were mentioned there you will also be able to sign up for our short and helpful email newsletter there you can learn how to become a patron and support the work it takes to produce a show for just a few dollars a month. And lastly, on the website, you can find out how to get in touch with us if you would like to share your child's story. This show was produced and edited by Lee and Winter Red. Thanks to Josh Woodward for letting us use his song, She Dreams in Blue. You can find him at joshwoodward.com. Subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why would you do this? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they are still a part of us.